And in a defeated and humiliated Pakistan, he stepped down. So it took a, a disastrous war to get rid of Yahya. Um, General Zayal Haq, the third dictator, again an American ally, um, was removed by uh, uh, being part of a still unexplained explosion in an aircraft in 1988. Um, perhaps assassinated is the common, commonly uh, held suspicion, in Pakistan at least. Uh, and compared to those three dictators, General Musharraf was removed in an entirely constitutional process whereby he has handed over power to a civilian leader who has now become a civilian president in Pakistan. Uh, that in and of itself represents a certain degree of progress. So what we've seen is one, an election which shows that the population doesn't necessarily um, have much sympathy for the kinds of groups of which Americans are, are perhaps justifiably very frightened at the moment as well as a political maturity which has seen the removal of a dictator with no bloodshed in a constitutional fashion. And uh, a third thing I'd like to just tell you that's been going on, which you may have seen in the newspapers, because there have been uh, quite a few newspapers that have uh, photographs in the last year or so of Pakistani lawyers in black jackets and black ties and white shirts on the streets um, being, you know, uh, baton charged by police officers. And this enormously uh, popular lawyers movement in Pakistan, um, you know, for which I have considerable sympathy as a lawyer, well, as a, somebody who trained as a lawyer uh, myself, um, stands for the very simple premise that people would like the rule of law to be upheld. And it's quite remarkable when you have mass popular support for that notion, for the idea that you can't dismiss a Supreme Court simply on whim. Um, that the, the judiciary must be allowed to function without political intervention. Uh, and this notion has uh, uh, captivated people to the extent that it's been impossible so far for any large Pakistani political party to ignore the demands of this group. In some ways, it's, it's you know, the first uh, that I can think of, the first you know, secular special interest lobbying group in Pakistan to have been somewhat effective in achieving what I think are, are very desirable ends. So this is, to a certain extent, the backdrop. Um, 2008, we've had these elections. We've seen the constitutional removal of a president. We've seen mass desire for rule of law. And behind all of this, what's been going on, and for this, General Musharraf uh, deserves uh, quite a bit of credit, is the liberalization of media in Pakistan that's taken place in the last decade. So in Pakistan, when I was growing up, we had one television channel called Pakistan Television. And it was on for a few hours a day. And when I moved back to Pakistan from California at the age of nine, I was immediately struck by the fact that uh, I couldn't watch any of my old favorite television programs. And in fact, there was nothing on TV most of the time. Um, but once or twice a week in the evenings, there'd be you know, a show like Trapper John MD or Knight Rider. <laughs> And as you can imagine, everybody I knew would stay up till 9 or 10 o'clock to watch that one hour show. Um, flash forward to the year 2008, Pakistan now has dozens of TV channels. It has music television channels that show rock videos with Pakistani bands. It has fashion television channels that show gay Pakistani designers talking about their wares. It has, um, what, well, up until last year, the most popular talk show in the country was hosted by a transvestite. Um, who would interview very serious political figures and totally disarm them with this uh, strange cross-dressed, you know, uh, talk show routine. <laughs> and uh, my wife was uh, an actress on a Pakistani sitcom uh, called Jat and Bond, which followed the adventures of a, a, a folk hero named Mola Jat up from the Punjab and a British agent who happened to have the name Bond. <laughs> and, uh, and so this is all going on, but in addition to this is a lot of news programming, current affairs programming, and, and television debate. And that's entirely new in Pakistan. Suddenly, there's a very powerful and very independent media that's deeply, fiercely critical of the government when it feels the need to do so, to be so, um, that has really changed the debate in the country. Uh, Pakistan, perhaps intentionally, for almost all of my life, didn't have public space. There was no way you could get your finger on the pulse of the nation, really. Um, now, all you have to do is turn on television, and you can watch debates happening between all sorts of figures, hear people calling in, um, and hear what, what's on people's minds. Now, 
what, you know, for the United States, the question is, um, what is on people's minds? And there's many things, obviously. There's uh, uh, rampant inflation at the moment, a chronic shortage of power, real economic insecurity, um, the violence of, of terrorist attacks taking place in the country. But one thing, in addition to all of that, is a hardening uh, anti-American sentiment. And, uh, and that, I think, is, uh, is very dangerous in, 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 in a number of different ways. It's not anti-American sentiment in the sense that these people, 97% of whom did not vote for religious parties, suddenly want to attack the United States. It is the suspicion that the alliance with the United States is not really an alliance. Um, it's not really a partnership between two nations that are, that are equals. But rather, um, it is a relationship in which Pakistan is subservient and which actions are being taken that are not in the interest of the Pakistani people. And whereas before, it had been easier perhaps for dictators in Pakistan to say, this will be the US-Pakistani alliance, in the new environment of greater democracy, greater media freedom, it actually requires convincing people that this is so, that the Pakistani alliance is an alliance and it is in people's interests. Um, and what this means for the United States is a different approach to relations with Pakistan. So America, I think, now does face a choice. It's, it's impossible any longer to be allied to a, a general in charge of the country. Um, it is only possible to be allied to the people of the country. And, um, and in, to that extent, it is trying to understand what Pakistanis think should be the solutions to the problems that they face which, coincidentally, happened to be the same problems that Americans face. So last year, uh, 3,000 Pakistanis were killed in terrorist attacks, about the same number as Americans who were killed in, in September 11th, the anniversary of which was yesterday. Um, the, these Pakistani victims, which are, who are being killed all over the country, um, create a desire in Pakistan to deal with this terrorist problem. Uh, it's not that there's in Pakistan the sense that, you know, uh, uh, we can ignore um, uh, terrorism in this country because it's America's problem. It's that it's very much our problem or Pakistani's problem. Yet, um, the American approach to this problem uh, seems to communicate, I think, that uh, it is America's problem and not a shared problem. And the way in which that happens is the following. So I read in the New York Times just this week that uh, the administration has authorized uh, special forces to go into Pakistan um, and conduct raids. Similarly, there's, there's uh, uh, bombs falling on Pakistani territory, predator drones firing in Pakistan. Now, um, what does that mean for an alliance when you act in this way? What you're basically saying is we will send our soldiers and our weaponry into your territory and conduct military acts inside your territory without, without your permission but we would, act, we would like you to continue to think of us as an ally. Um, that's a very hard sell. And, uh, for the simple reason that, if, imagine that it were Brooklyn instead of Waziristan that we're talking about. And we have a tip off that somewhere on Flatbush Avenue is holed up a group of Al-Qaeda operatives. And we have a pretty good idea where they are. Now, imagine the outcry if we use an F-16 to drop a bomb on Flatbush Avenue, happened to miss the Al-Qaeda operatives and kill 90 people at a wedding party. Uh, it wasn't that we wanted to kill 90 people at a wedding party, um, and our intentions were actually to get these Al-Qaeda operatives. But in acting in this way, what we've shown is a complete disregard for the lives of innocent civilians nearby. And the reason we wouldn't do that in the United States is because that would turn popular opinion so devastatingly against this policy that showed disregard for the civilians who were being killed um, that we would say, look, we would much rather use the police and whatever else to go and get these guys, um, even if it takes a bit longer and, and is a bit harder, because we can't accept this sort of collateral damage. Pakistanis, I think, tend to feel similarly about how the war on terror should be waged in Pakistan. Um, you know, it is, a, it is thought of as a long-term, slow um, slog, really, uh, and one in which a great deal of caution is required because nobody wants to see uh, those deaths of innocent Pakistanis who happen to be living in the same area as these terrorists. And, uh, uh, and it would be, I think, quite possible for the US and Pakistan to work together to do this, except that a few things are taking place. One is that uh, Pakistan is being caught up in US policy in Afghanistan. I don't particularly want to get into detail about US policy in Afghanistan. Uh, but what I would like to say is just to point out something which is relative size. 
Pakistan has a population larger than Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Iran, and Afghanistan combined. 